Okay, here we are, lesson uh, number 10 in our series, uh, Elders, uh, Deacons, Preachers and Saints. Uh, today's uh, title is The Selection Process. So as the title suggests, uh, we're going to discuss the selection process for elders and deacons. Now I mentioned that these lessons were not uh, given simply as academic exercises, but you know, I want us to have some practical information um, on the selection process for elders and deacons so that if uh, in our experience or perhaps in the experience of uh, members of churches elsewhere who might see this uh, a series on video, uh, if they're uh, at the point where they're selecting elders or deacons, uh, there'll be at least some concrete information, some practical information uh, in this series about how to go about and do that. So in this lesson, we're going to review some of the requirements and some of the various ways used to actually select elders and deacons in the church. So I want to start with deacons because we have a, a clearer picture in the New Testament concerning their tasks and their selection and their qualifications. So let's talk about their qualifications, shall we? As far as the qualifications, we've already said, I'm not going to belabor this too much because we've talked about this already. Deacons were men, they were to have charge or responsibilities over a certain task. Uh, once defined by the elders, uh, the idea is that the, uh, the deacons take charge of that task once it's been outlined by the leaders in the church. They were to be men who had good reputations. They were spiritually minded men. Uh, I might make a note here that a lot of times you know, we, we forget that idea. We think so long as somebody is handy uh, with tools or a, uh, is a plumber or, or, or perhaps an accountant or something like that, that uh, you know, that's enough. But we, we don't want just men who are handy with their hands or have some, some skills. We also want men who are spiritually minded, very important part of the, um, of the requirements for this role in church. Uh, also men who were talented or gifted in various ways, individuals who were uh, <clears throat> excuse me, respectable, honest, sober, not greedy, faithful to the word. They also were to be men who had uh, experience in church work, not novices, uh, married only once, and uh, men that manage their own households well. Again, a review of some of the things we've already talked about. I also said that uh, we looked for these qualifications in these people to be present uh, to a, a, a positive degree, not necessarily a perfect degree, right? I mean, in other words, we realize that no one is perfectly honest or perfectly faithful, but we want someone who exhibits these qualities to a positive degree where we can actually see that the, uh, these qualities are there. Uh, we know that a man may not be perfectly honest, but we recognize in his general character that he's generally an honest man and he's making an effort to be an honest man. So that's how we are judging these things. Now, as far as selection is concerned, the New Testament provides us with a clear example of how the deacons were chosen in Acts chapter 6. We see, first of all, the congregation looked among themselves for men who qualify, and they put these men forward. Then these people were approved of by the leadership, and at that time the leadership consisted of only the apostles. And then they were commended or ordained into service by praying and the laying on of hands of the leadership, as I say, the leadership being the apostles at that time. Now we know that this system was perpetuated because Paul gives further qualifications for deacons to Timothy in 1 in Timothy. This means that today, in our times, we can follow the same pattern for selecting deacons. So let's imagine, if you will, we were to select deacons here. How would we do it? Well, first of all, we would look among ourselves, among our congregation, for men who are qualified to serve in this role. Then um, uh, in, in, in this particular case, if we were doing it here, uh, I would provide worksheets so that you could review the qualifications and keep track of the names. And here's, a, here's an example of a, uh, a worksheet. Notice all the qualifications are there. 
Uh, and uh, there's a certain marking system that you can use in order to mark if you see these qualifications or not. And there are various symbols. So if there's a check in one of the boxes, it means that you know this about them and they qualify in your opinion. If you put a question mark in the box next to the qualification, it means that you're not sure or you have no knowledge in this area. And you know, sometimes uh, is this person hospitable? Well, you, you don't know. You've never, you know, you've never experienced it. Uh, uh, you live too far. You don't know them well enough. So you would put a question mark if you don't know. And then of course, if you do know something about this person and they really don't qualify in a particular area, then you would, then you would put an X. So using these symbols, you would mark according to your knowledge of that individual, you would assess that individual according to the qualifications. Uh, next step, a list of those who would be put forward by the congregation would be made and presented to the elders for their approval. And then finally, those approved would be given their charge and commended to service by prayer and the laying on of hands by our elders once the process would be complete. So to review, you would use the sheets on the deacon side, because the sheets have deacons on one side, elders on the other. So you'd use the sheets on the deacon side to make your selection. So um, if certain men, if you want someone to be nominated, you fill out a sheet, put their name on it, check off with the different symbols, you know, your assessment of their qualifications, and hand that in uh, to the elders. The elders have all of these individuals, all these sheets, if you wish, from different people, recommending different people, and they would assess uh, what the sheets uh, would say, and then they would uh, you know, select those individuals that have been put forward, they would uh, process with uh, uh, an interview, uh, discussing uh, various issues with these men who have been put forward, and then the elders would decide which ones of these uh, would finally be nominated to serve as uh, as a deacon. And I would remind you that an X, you know, if you don't think a person qualifies in one area, you put an X. Uh, an X in one area doesn't automatically disqualify someone. It, 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 it only alerts to the idea that perhaps there's a weakness in that particular individual. And we'd need the elders to decide uh, after the interview uh, if the candidate could still be put forward despite the X there that you may have put for one of their qualifications. Also, I would tell everyone, fill in all the boxes. Don't leave any blanks. So yes, you see it, X you don't, or you don't know. I think that would cover pretty much everything. All right? So that's, that, that would be the process of selecting elders, uh, excuse me, selecting deacons. Okay? Now let's see what the process would be because it's not the same to select elders. The selection process of elders, again, not as straightforward as that of deacons, and uh, we'll deal with that in a, in a moment. But as far as qualifications are concerned, so if we're going to select elders in this congregation, what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for uh, individuals, of course, who are men. Uh, they exercise the leadership of Christ in the local assembly, that's what they do. They love the church. They work well with others. They can make decisions. They're dependable. They can share their lives with the church. Also, they desire to serve as elders. It's one of the first qualifications, you know, a man who desires this work. And they are married to only one uh, woman. They manage their households well. And their children, whatever number of children they have, are believers. And they also are able to teach and they are faithful to the word uh, themselves. Now Paul also mentions a number of other qualifications in 1 Timothy and Titus that refer to their character. For example, they are uh, moderate and prudent, sober-minded, gentle, uh, respectable, hospitable, they have a good reputation. They're not men who are argumentative or violent or greedy. And they're someone uh, who uh, is just, devout, someone who's a lover of what is good and what is right in life and, and certainly in the church. Of course, the idea of possessing 
all of these qualifications to a positive and not a perfect degree is the same here as with deacons, a much higher level, right? A much higher maturity level, a spiritual level that we're requiring for the elders, but the idea is the same as it is with deacons. Uh, you know, how moderate does a man have to be? How prudent does he have to be? How gentle, how hospitable? What kind of good reputation? A perfect reputation, you see what I'm saying? So we have to judge, uh, is it positive, not is it, is it perfect? That's how you, that's how you decide. Um, also, the, um, the deacon's work, you know, that changes. He could be put in a charge of a certain task and so on and so forth, and once the task is done, that man can be you know, put in, an, in charge of another task or another area of work. So many times the work of the deacon changes, but the work of elders always remains the same. So the work of elders is threefold. Uh, you know, we've gone over this, but just to summarize, first, they protect the congregation against fake or false teaching and false teachers. It's why we have elders in our, you ever notice there are elders sitting in all the Bible classes, especially the adult Bible classes and the youth Bible classes. Uh, and they're there, of course, to encourage the class, encourage the teacher, but also they're making sure that what is being taught is biblical, is correct. Um, secondly, they promote and direct sound teaching, good works, unity, and peace. They're there doing that through their teaching, through their example, through their encouragement, through their leadership. And also they provide leadership and example uh, for good works and sound teaching. Now the difference between elders and deacons is that elders are charged with shepherding the flock by ministering the word to them and also providing examples of leadership and mature Christian living. That's their task. And deacons are charged with carrying out works of service towards the church and the community. Both uh, very important tasks uh, and very different tasks. Okay? They're complementary, but they're, they're different. All right, so how do we select elders? Now there are several ways and thinking that have developed in the church about the selection of elders. And I want to present three major views uh, about, you know, that have come about as to how we um, select elders uh, and, and some of the for and against these uh, particular views. So first of all, one view says only the evangelist or only the preacher selects the elders. And this view was held, and I think may still be held, by the international church. Some people call it the Boston movement or discipleship movement, but normally they're called international churches of Christ. They at one time used this method. The argument is that in the only examples where elders are appointed, the apostles or the evangelists are doing the appointing or the selecting. And if we were to use this process in this church, then I would be the one selecting the men and appointing them to the eldership as Timothy did and Titus did. Another view is that the church actually selects the men and then the elders approve the choice of the church. So a lot of churches do this by having a committee select names and then submitting them to the elders. Uh, now, the argument for this particular procedure in selecting elders is based on two things. First, the word appoint in Acts chapter 14 verse 23, sometimes translated ordained, hang on a second here, comes from a Greek word that meant um, holding up or stretching out one's hand as in to vote or to signify the raising of one's hand as a choice or a an approval, okay? So some scholars say that this shows that the congregations approved of elders by holding up their hands and the choice was made by them. Kind of a, kind of a vote, you know, by hand signal. Some early writings from the second and third centuries describe churches selecting and rejecting elders by vote. And this was a, a, a usual pattern in, uh, in Jewish synagogues and it is assumed that, was, uh, that it was continued in the Christian church. So if we, if we were to use this method, then you, the congregation, would do the same procedure as that 
you know, that I've talked about for deacons. In other words, you select men according to their qualifications and you submit them to the elders or to the leadership for approval. So that's the second opinion on how to choose elders. The, the, the first opinion is the preacher chooses them. The second opinion is, well, the, the congregation chooses them and you know, the existing eldership approves of them. Then there's a third, uh, a third way. The elders and the evangelist select a man who is desiring to serve as an elder and the congregation confirms his selection by affirming that he does indeed qualify according to the scripture. So basically, uh, it's a combination. The elders and the preacher to, in concert select a man, pick a man, and, and the congregation examines that man to make sure that he uh, qualifies. And there are arguments for this procedure as well. First of all, it follows the New Testament example for selection. In Acts 14, 23, the apostles who served as elders in the, in the beginning, they're the ones who selected. But in the book of Titus, it was the preacher who selected. So there's no example or command or even inference that shows that the congregation was the one that initially selected. But we do have two examples where the leaders, the, evangel the, uh, the elders, or the evangelists selected. See what I'm trying to get at here? You know, when we're examining how, how do we choose elders and we just look only at the Bible, there's no example of the church selecting people to be elders. But there are examples of apostles or elders or evangelists selecting people to be uh, elders. Secondly, um, it includes the congregation in the process. In other words, this third way here, you know, chosen by the leadership, the elders and the preacher, confirmed by the, by the congregation. That method um, uh, is the process that we see in 1 Timothy 3.2. You know, being above reproach and being hospitable and able to teach and so on and so forth, these qualifications can only be determined by the people that that individual has contact with, and that's the congregation. You know, the, the sheep don't choose their shepherd, but they can choose if they're going to follow or not, right? And then thirdly, uh, it bases the, this method here, bases the selection process only on the scriptures, not on commentaries or traditions or historical writings. So if, you're only go, if your only source for how you choose elders is going to be the Bible, then this third procedure is the one that I would recommend to follow. So that when men will come forward and are selected to serve as elders, their names will be put before the congregation and, and you would have a, a worksheet in the same way that you had the sheet for the deacons, you would have a worksheet also to help confirm if these men are biblically qualified. And if they are, they will be commended to the service of the eldership through the prayer and the laying on of hands of the elders. So you see this third way here? Uh, between the preacher and the elders, they're the ones recruiting, they're the ones looking, they're the ones scouting for men that they feel could be qualified to serve as elders. And when they find, let's say, one of these individuals, then they place that individual before the congregation and say, we think that this man is worthy to serve as an elder and we need the congregation to examine him and confirm that what we believe is actually accurate. And so the mechanism that we would use would be that sheet, you know, same kind of sheet as for the deacons, except for elders with the listing of all the qualification for elders that uh, each individual in the congregation would kind of mark as they examine the life and the character and the actions and service of that particular uh, man, uh, of course, and his wife and his family. You see what I'm saying? So it's a collaboration, if you wish, of the elders, the preacher, and the congregation working together to select that uh, individual. All right, one other thing that I'd like to deal with, and that is fasting. Uh, not just fasting all by itself, but fasting in connection with selecting uh, individuals. 
Um, I believe the Bible teaches that fasting is optional because it was optional in the New Testament. For example, sometimes they didn't fast, like in the selection of deacons in Acts chapter six, no one fasted before they laid hands on them. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, where the elders lay hands on Timothy, commend him to the service of evangelism, there's no mention of the elders fasting before they do this. And then sometimes when you read through the New Testament, you see that, well, sometimes they did fast. For example, in Acts chapter 13, verse three, when they selected and sent off uh, uh, Paul and Barnabas on their missionary journey, it says that they prayed and fasted and then they laid hands on them. And then in Acts chapter 14, verse 23, where elders were selected. Again, the idea of fasting comes into play here. So sometimes when they selected and commended someone to service, they didn't fast. And sometimes when they selected and commended someone to service, they did fast. And then sometimes we, we don't know. In Titus chapter one, verse five, the selection of elders, we don't know if he fasted or not. What we do know is that they prayed and they laid hands on these individuals to commend them to service, and sometimes they also fasted. So our elders today are free to choose if they wish to fast before they appoint new elders by prayer and the laying on of hands or not. It is a personal choice, I believe, that the Bible uh, gives that to us. Now we would use, of course, the same type of worksheet to evaluate the qualifications of those who would be put forth for consideration as elders. And I've provided these for the class and online for those people watching online or watching this on video on the BibleTalk.tv website. You can go to this lesson and download the, uh, the student um, worksheet as well as the um, uh, uh, as well as the, uh, the sheets uh, for qualifications, uh, you can download those as well. So uh, just to summarize here, um, in order to minister to a growing congregation, uh, not just elders and deacons, but everyone needs to dedicate themselves to finding ways to serve the church, okay? Not just deacons that serve, not just elders that serve, everyone serves, men serve, women serve, young, old, those who are experienced and those who may have less experience, everyone is called to service. When we're talking about deacons and elders, what we're talking about are individuals that have a particular service to give because they have particular skills and particular qualifications and they have been selected and confirmed by, uh, the, uh, by the church. So the church, of course, needs godly men who are willing to sacrifice themselves on the altar of service by taking on the responsibilities of elders and of deacons. And I hope that in our congregation, uh, when the time comes, uh, we'll have many men ready to step forward and take on these uh, roles of uh, leadership and service in our own congregation. And I hope in all the congregations, uh, individuals that are watching this program. Okay, so that's it for this week. Selection process, some resources that uh, can help that uh, along. So next week we're going to look at the role, the qualifications, we're going to move on to the preacher. So we've had elders and deacons, now we're going to look at preachers or evangelists, their role, their qualifications, their task, and so on and so forth. So that's it for today. Thank you very much for your attention, and we'll see you next time.